Hey guys, Political Junkie 2414 here, and welcome back to my next election prediction video. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, September 2nd at the time I'm recording this of uh, 2022. We're going to be doing an updated look at my 2022 U.S. Senate predictions. This is going to be my ninth prediction. We are getting so close to the midterms. We've got, like, what is it, 66 days? Yeah, we, we're about uh, 60, a little under 67 days away from the midterm elections. They're getting extremely close. Democrats are doing very well so far. I hope you all are having a great day. I should say that first. Make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, check out my non-political channel, Interactor127, and my comrade, Growling666. And, uh, yeah, let's get right into it. So Democrats have been doing very, very well recently. Uh, if you haven't seen it or you haven't heard about it yet, um, Democrats just won in Alaska. Mary Peltola defeated Sarah Palin. I made a video about this yesterday. And yes, it was because of ranked choice voting, but this is a flip for the Democratic Party in a state that they have not been able to win for 50 years. Don Young, the incumbent Republican, had held this seat um, you know, from 1973 until this year when he sadly passed away in March. And yes, it was ranked choice voting. I think that that certainly helped Peltola. But the thing is, wouldn't you expect a lot of people to have put Nick Begich as their first choice and Sarah Palin as their second choice? Yes, she's unpopular. But if it's so, it's a fit, if it's so a so-called red wave year, why why did you know Mary Peltola get second place? Well, it's because Palin's unpopular. It's because Alaska is a super pro-choice state, and she clearly has a way to um, emphasize with voters. And when, you know, this is a flip for Democrats, I think that it's going to be a very tight race in Alaska in November. Of course, the Senate election is going to be a little bit different because, you know, it's between Murkowski and Shabaka, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Joe Biden's approval has been up on the rise. He is now officially more popular than Donald Trump was at this point in his presidency. You know, he is just down by 10.1%. I'm just seeing this right now because I um, I looked at, I've been checking on his approval. I haven't checked on it yet today. You can see that he's four points ahead of Trump now. And he's been rising and rising. You know, he's been making speeches. He made that speech last night in Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, he he's getting back on the campaign trail. He's really starting to help Democrats. I don't think he's going to be approved of on Election Day, but he could very well be close to that. So yeah, things are looking on the up and up for Democrats. Republicans just lost Alaska. Yes, it was due to ranked choice voting, but Mary, Mary Peltola should not have gotten that many Nick Begich voters to put her as their second choice. And uh, yeah, this is going to, you know, look like a very good map for the Democratic Party. Um, you know, I, I will admit that, you know, this might, some of these predictions I'm a little unsure about. But, you know, I'm getting to a point where, you know, we are constantly underestimating Democrats in these House special elections. And yes, this is a Senate election. It's statewide. But, you know, when you look at Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin and you look at Sherry Beasley in North Carolina, while they both may not be doing the best, you know, Mandela Barnes is, of course, doing better than Sherry Beasley. I'm becoming more and more hesitant about, you know, doubting on them because we have doubted on Democrats in a special election after special election. And the Senate, I think, is no longer a toss up. I think Democrats are outright favored right now. You know, Republicans can still win the Senate, but their choice of candidates and, you know, their their decision, the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade has really, really hurt the GOP. So let's get started. We're going to fill in the safe Democratic and Republican states. These are states that are going to go to either party by, you know, over uh, 15 percentage points. Really, um, you know, these are the uh, safe states have very little chance of going to the opposition party. And uh, I'll talk about a couple of these in a second. Uh, so, um, first of all, in the state of Washington, I'll talk about this one. This one was considered to be slightly competitive, you know, for uh, a little while. You know, Patty Murray has had a history of um, underperforming. She only won by four points in 2010, but she did under or five points in 2010, but she did overperform her polling average by about uh, uh, four points. Uh, Dino Rossi was a very good candidate, and um, you know there was a really good chance that Republicans flipping Washington. Uh, Murray did a lot better in 2016, and I do expect her to win again. The poll, the uh, open primary in Washington really, you know, just showed a really bad sign for Tiffany Smiley. This race was never going to flip anyway, but it was getting you know surprisingly close back a couple months ago. I really, you know, this is probably going to be the last time I talk about Washington until you know it starts to narrow up again because you know. Other states are narrowing up, and Washington is, you know, I've had it as safe for a while. I did start off my prediction history with it being likely, but, 
it's uh yeah it's it, it's staying that way murray leads by uh, 13 points on average but she's outperformed polling expectations before she is not the most popular democrat she's been in you know the senate for a very long time but she's still going to win regardless in utah you know i'm becoming more apprehensive about about mike lee but i mean you know even though utah's a traditionally republican state and mike lee is very is relatively unpopular. You know, Evan McMullen, I really don't know if he's going to caucus with the GOP. I know he said he won't, you know, caucus with either party. I trust him a lot more than I do other politicians. You know, being an independent, he will get some conservatives to his side and some Democrats to his side. And so, you know, I did have this race originally as likely. You know, I think that, um, you know, there's a good chance that McMullen stays as an independent, but, you know, politicians don't always keep their promises. And Utah is going to reelect Mike Lee regardless. You know, Utah is Utah. It does have, you know, Mitt Romney as a senator, and Lee is pretty extreme. He's, you know, he's very tied to Donald Trump, but he did say, uh, it was interesting because he supported McMullen over Trump for president in 2016, but Lee is just very far right, and Utah is still the very conservative state. It's not a Trump state, you know, it's more like Alaska or, or Texas, you know, Trump has done pretty bad there for a Republican in Utah, underperformed with John McCain and Mitt Romney, but it's still Utah. And it's still going to elect a Republican nonetheless. If they do elect McMullen, you know, I'll be very happy. I really like Evan McMullen. But, you know, it, it, it's Utah. It's, you know, that it would, ta it would take a lot for this, you know, this race to um, narrow, up, narrow up to the point where McMullen can actually win it realistically. In Missouri, Eric Greidens did not get the nomination. Uh, Eric Schmidt did. Uh, you know, Trump did not. I made a video, you know, mocking Trump, you know, for, you know, putting out an endorsement of Eric. He pretty much put out a dual endorsement. Schmidt won the primary. The independent John Wood, who could have made the race likely, the conservative independent, uh, who I think worked uh, with, uh, he was a... Uh, he was um, an advisor to George W. Bush, I believe. He dropped out of the race. He could have made this race likely. And Trudy Bush of Valentine isn't a terrible candidate, but I think Lucas Kuntz would have been a better candidate. And Eric Schmidt, you know, is a much better candidate for Republicans than Erica Greidens was. Um, so that's really it for the safe states. We're going to go over the likely states now. In uh, For Democrats, it's just one likely state, the state of Colorado. Um, you know, Joe O'Dea is a good candidate for the Republican Party, but Michael Bennett has been able to outperform expectations before he did underperform in 2016. But in 2010, he was trailing Ken Buck in a lot of these polls, and Ken Buck was a pretty bad candidate, and yet he still was able to win in, a, in an environment that was a lot redder than 2022 is going to be. You know, 2022 should be like 2010. Honestly, it should be redder, but it just simply isn't because we're a much more polarized nation and Republicans have really shot themselves in the foot in a lot of these races. Colorado, they have a good candidate, but Joe Day, uh, you know, he's going to do well in the suburbs or uh, the Denver suburbs. He's going to do a lot better. You know, Bennett's going to underperform Joe, Joe Biden. But he's still the fairly popular incumbent, and it's Colorado. Jared, Pol Jared Polis is going to help Bennett, and Joe O'Dea. You know, he's a he's a very moderate Republican. You know, and you know he he will probably make this race like six or seven points for Michael Bennett, but still. You know, he, he's going to be seen as far too conservative for a lot of people. He'll do well in the rural areas. I hear a lot of, you know, right-wing YouTubers saying, oh, he can't win because of the rural areas. He's going to get support for, from them anyway. Maybe not as much as a normal Republican would, but he needs to, you know, Republicans need to put up a moderate candidate in Colorado to win. But I don't think they're going to win with Joe O'Dea. He is very moderate, but, you know, it's become a much bluer state in, the in you know, the last couple of years. In the state of Iowa, this race practically is safe for Chuck Grassley. It really should be. You know, even when Iowa was considered a hotly contested swing state, Chuck Grassley was able to win by overwhelming margins. Um, you know, I... I think that this race will be double digits for Gra Grassley, but I do think it'll be slightly under 15, probably 13 or 14 points. Michael Franken was the right candidate for the Democratic Party. Uh, Seltzer and Co. put out a poll. They're very accurate in Iowa. They said that uh, Trump will win by seven points in 2020 when everyone else had the race, you know, in a dead heat. Uh, Trump won by eight, so they do have a bit of a Democratic uh, lean or bias, I guess you could say. But, you know, still, they had Grassley only up by eight, and yes, there were a lot of undecideds. Iowa could very well become a safe state, I think, or safe for Chuck Grassley again, but it's going to be his closest election since uh, 1980. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, he's not going to lose. Iowa is not really that competitive this election cycle. It's relatively competitive for Chuck Grassley, but Kim Reynolds will help Grassley. 
and Grassley will help Kim Reynolds. And, you know, Democrats have a really, you know, just kind of non-existent gubernatorial nominee in the state of Iowa. They can do well in Iowa. You know, Trump really locked down Iowa for Republicans. Um, but Chuck Grassley has, you know, never had a competitive race. Um, and his margins have consistently gone down in a lot of these more recent elections. You know, he won by 42 in 2004, a massive margin when George W. Bush only barely won the state. He won every single county. In 2010, he won by 31 points, so a big shift to the left, but still very large. Then in 2016, he won by 25 points, and there were some competitive polls between him and Patty Judge. I do think, you know, I was too early to make Iowa likely, but, you know, still that original poll that was made by Franken's campaign, I wasn't sure if it would be wrong by 15 points. You know, it had Grassley up by f by f only three, and I knew that that wouldn't happen, but I was, you know, I didn't think it would be wrong by 12, and I think that Grassley will win by, you know, uh, the, the mid sing single or not mid single mid double digits so like 13 14 points very close to safe this race could very well become safe again but you know grassley's got a bit of a fight on his hands but he's still gonna win regardless florida i think that this race is getting overhyped for its competitive nature val demings is a good candidate but marco rubio just has so much appeal in a state that's already trending to the right the polls are narrowing up in Florida, and I could see this race going, getting, or, you know, getting a little bit closer, but Florida's polls almost always overestimate Democrats. You know, it has shown a competitive race between Rubio and Demings, and it was always going to be competitive, but realistically, Val Demings is not going to win. I think that right now, Rubio wins by about the same margin in 2016, though the margin, you know, is significantly closer than what I thought it would be just about, just a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, getting interested in getting interested in Florida. Ron DeSantis' approval rating is dropping, and Charlie Crist is a good nominee for Democrats, so is Val Demings, but they're, they're just, they, it's going to be very hard for them to win. So now we have the lean states, which are, you know, the likely states were going to uh, go to either party by a margin of 5 to 15 percent, or percentage points. Um, now we have the lean states, which will, you know, are more competitive. They, um, you know, these are states that are, you know, almost certainly going, or not almost certainly, but are very competitive, but, you know, are relatively competitive, but they are, you know, they do have, you know, a clear advantage for either candidate. It's pretty slight, but it's still strong enough to, you know, put it over 1%, you know, because, I mean, you know, the, you, you, you know, it, it's, it's still, you know, this is a lot of estimation. A lot of these states could be wrong, but, you know, I think most of them will be right. And, you know, these are going to, you know, be more, uh, you know, my prediction is a little bit biased towards Democrats, but, you know, I try to be as, um, I try to be as objective as possible. And, you know, seeing how Democrats have been overperforming, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, this is how some of these races turn out. In the state of Ohio, I'm keeping that as lean. J.D. Vance, you know, has been getting a lot of support from Mitch McConnell. You know, Republicans have had to push a lot of money into Ohio. Tim Ryan's really being, you know, the bait for Democrats. You know, I really like Tim Ryan. I really hope that he wins this race, but I just think it, it's going to be really hard for him. Ohio is still the red state through and through. Roe v. Wade's going to help Tim Ryan, but, you know, J.D. JD Vance is still, you know, going to win. Democrats were favored in the governor's race in 2018. Um, you know, and they still lost it. Uh, you know, Richard Cordray lost to Mike DeWine, and DeWine's easily going to win this time. You know, Nan Whale is an okay candidate for the governor race, but, you know, against DeWine, she really doesn't stand a chance. Tim Ryan does, but I, I still think J.D. Vance is favored in the long run, and I don't think that that's going to change. Um, uh, now we have some of the lean Democratic states. Uh, it's first is the, is the state of New Hampshire. I think that Don Bullduck is going to win the nomination. Uh, the primary is going to be in a couple of weeks from now. I think it's the last primary, you know, because Louisiana technically doesn't have a primary. You know, it has a jungle primary on November 8th, but, you know, that's not a state worth discussing, and, you know, John Kennedy is going to win there. But in New Hampshire, the primary is on the 13th of September. Maggie Hassan, you know, dodged a bullet when uh, Chris Sununu decided to, uh, you know, to stay out of the race. And, um, you know, he probably would have defeated Hassan, you know, it still would have been a competitive race, it wouldn't have been like his governor margin in 2020, but it still would have, you know, probably gone to uh, Sununu, you know, this would have been, you know, a very competitive race, and Democrats can't really win the Senate if they lose New Hampshire. Um, you know, there is still a chance that Chuck Morris wins the nomination, in which case this race could be a little bit more competitive, but I still think that Morris is a little too conservative to win. Really, you know, Republicans, you know, are probably going to nominate Bullduck, who's like a QAnon conspiracy theorist not going to do well in the socially moderate state of New Hampshire, or socially liberal, but fiscally conservative state of New Hampshire. Maggie Hassan, of course, defeated Kelly Ayotte by a very small amount in 2016, which does say that she's very vulnerable. 
but a yacht won by 23 points in 2010. And, uh, yeah, New Hampshire's not, so New Hampshire could go red, but I just really don't see it. I think if Bulldog wins the nomination, this race could go likely. If Morse wins it, it it'll probably stay lean, possibly go into tilt. Um, but, you know, I still think Hassan is strong enough to win. She was able to survive 2014 in her governor's race, you know, along with Jean Shaheen. But still, you know, Hassan's a very strong incumbent, but she is vulnerable. You know, New Hampshire does have, a, um, you know, does like to shift all over the place. They're not a big fan of the presidential incumbents, but Senate elections, it's a little bit different. And Hassan, you know, is, you know, an exceptional candidate in the state of New Hampshire. In Pennsylvania, oh boy, what do I say here? Uh, so much has happened since my last prediction. Uh, yeah, that crudite, crudite video really screwed over Dr. Oz. Uh, you know, he is closing the gap with John Fetterman, which, you know, makes sense. Fetterman's not going to win by eight points, which is how how much he's up by on average. But still, I mean, Pennsylvania was such a winnable race for the GOP. They've just had, you know, disaster after disaster. Fetterman is a strong candidate. She, um, or he is pretty, you know, progressive. I've heard that, you know, he's planning not to, or he is, um, not super willing to debate Oz, but still he's been trapped. He's been destroying him in polling, you know, even when he's had a stroke. And now he's officially back on the campaign trail. Yes, there are some, you know, concerns about his health. I personally am concerned about his health, but he is a good, he is a good candidate. Oz was just a terrible nominee. Terrible. And I've heard rumors that Kathy Barnett's going to stage a writing campaign, you know, and I, I just, you know, I, I really think that, you know, Republicans really, really messed up in Pennsylvania. If Pat Toomey was running again, he probably would have faced a primary challenge had, you know, had he uh, still voted to impeach Trump, which I don't think he would have, you know, because it's, it's different when you're running for re-election, you know, you, you more, you're more likely to vote your conscience when you know you're not, you're not uh, running again. Um, but, you know, Pat Toomey probably would have won against uh, John Fetterman. Uh, Kathy Barnett would have, you know, gotten destroyed. Um, but, you know, at least she has, you know, a bit of a base elite, you know, she's a lot more extreme than Doug Mastriano, but, you know, Mastriano was going up against Josh Shapiro in the governor's race. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow in the governor prediction. Um, David McCormick would have wiped the floor with Fetterman, you know, he, he, it would have been a close race, don't get me wrong. Democrats would have still been eyeing this race, but it would have been so, so hard for them to win because McCormick was such a good candidate and that bruising primary, you know, I, it was, you know, problem after problem for Oz, and now that he's in the general, he just cannot catch a break, and now he's insulting John Fetterman, you know, for, you know, he, he claims, you know, that he hasn't eaten, if he ate a vegetable ever in his life, that maybe wouldn't have had a stroke, which is just, you know, put putting politics aside, it's just so rude and so unethical, and, you know, he very well could win, this is still a very competitive race, but... You know, he, Republicans really screw themselves over in Pennsylvania. They're not giving Doug Mastriano money. They're, you know, they're, they're um, signs, you know, it's, it looks like that there are some signs that they're just going to drop out of this race. You know, it, it's it's really just really hard for Republicans to win here in Pennsylvania right now. But it is going to be competitive and us still could win. In Arizona, Blake Masters, a terrible candidate as well. Not as bad as Oz, nearly. Um, not nearly as bad as Oz, but, you know, he is a very far-right candidate. Of course, you know, he... His former boss, Peter Thiel, is, um, you know, helping him fundraise his campaign. Thiel does not believe in democracy, or, you know, he said that he doesn't like the fact that women are allowed to vote. Masters has tried to moderate his positions on abortion. In Arizona, you know, I think Kerry Lake will do better than Blake Masters, but we're comparing apple, apples to oranges in terms of electability. You know, Katie Hobbs is really going to make that race really difficult for Democrats to win, but, you know, I still have them favored. We'll, you know, talk about that tomorrow. Mark Kelly is a very good incumbent, you know, I think that he's going to win by around two points, you know, yes, he underperformed his polling average, but he's up by more than he was on election day 2020, well, he's up by more now than he was on election day 2020, I think that this race will be closer, possibly, um, but, you know, he's on, he's up by, on average, by seven points, poll after poll, even Trafalgar, you know, Republican poll after Republican poll, Democratic poll after Democratic poll, shows Blake Masters trailing Mark Kelly, I don't think he's losing by eight, I don't even think he's losing by four, I think it's more two to three points as of right now, you know, Arizona could go red, but, you know, he's gonna have a really hard time with those, you know, Blake Masters is gonna have a really hard time with those McCain voters, and, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's a very competitive race, it's a toss-up still, you know, Arizona is a very competitive state, 
but you know, I still think you know the path to victory for Blake Masters would be to get amazing turnout in the rural areas, which I don't necessarily doubt he could do. But he would also need to really narrow up Maricopa County, which you know I think is it's it's pretty clear that Mark Kelly I think is going to win re-election. You know, it's still going to be a very close race, and Blake Masters could win. But you know, he needs all a lot of you know support from and from uh, Maricopa voters, and you know, it doesn't look like he's getting that. Um, you know, he doesn't need to win Maricopa to win the election, but, you know, he, he, he's, you know, he needs to make it very close in that case. In Georgia, you know, I'm debating whether to put this as lean D or tilt D. Herschel Walker's been doing better in polling, but, you know, the Trafalgar Group poll, the Trafalgar poll is just, you know, they've been so inaccurate in, you know, the past. Yes, it is getting a lot closer. You know, Warnock is up by one. You know, this race is probably going to go into a runoff. I don't see Walker being able to get 50%, and the runoff's going to really help uh, Warnock here. Um, but, you know, Emerson College, that is concerning, but, you know, Emerson, Trafalgar all overestimated Trump in 2020. They said that he was going to win the state. He did not. You know, Raphael Warnock is a very um, strong incumbent. He is very vulnerable. You know, he's probably the most vulnerable or the second most vulnerable um, Democratic incumbent in the cycle, uh, um, you know, in the Senate up for re-election this cycle. Uh, you know, the second, the first being Cortez Mosto in Nevada, which we'll talk about in a minute, you know, but I think that you know, Walker just has, you know, he is doing well in polling, but he's just, you know, he has gaff after gaff, and he's just, you know, I feel bad for him, honestly, you know, if he does get elected, I wish him the best, but I do not want Herschel Walker to be the next United States Senator from Georgia, he would be a new low in the U.S. Senate, you know, I I, I just really think, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and, you know, I feel bad for him, because, you know, I know it's from all those football injuries, you know, that that's my suspicion, is, you know, his, the, and the allegations against him for fathering children with women that weren't his wife and, you know, for abusing his uh, his uh, ex-wife, you know, it's just, it's it, it's really damning. You know, Warnock's going to get very good turnout. It's going to be closer than 2020, uh, the 2021 runoff with Warnock and uh, Leffler, and Leffler, but I still think that Herschel Walker's pathway to victory, you know, is, you know, it, it's, it's narrowing up, you know, Georgia is narrowing up, but Warnock has a very strong lead, and he's had a strong lead for a very long time, and these polls, you know, do tend to overestimate Republicans. Trafalgar said that Kemp would win in uh, 2018 against Abrams by 12 points, he only won by one, so big overestimation there. They said Trump will win the state in 2020, of course, Biden narrowly won it, so yeah, you have to, you know, it, it's really looking like a really hard pathway to victory for Herschel Walker right now, but it's still possible. Georgia's going to be very close, but I think it's going to go into a runoff. So as of right now, you know, you see the Democrats have now gone into 50. So if there is a tie, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Vice President Harris would uh, break the tie. But uh, that's not all. So um, in the state of North Carolina, I'm having a bit of, you know, internal qualms about because North Carolina is not a super pro-choice state. You know, not like New Hampshire, not like, uh, you know, not not like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, you know, and this race is getting closer. You know, the 538 average now has butt up again. This race is really narrowing up. But after the Alaska result, and, you know, even though North Carolina polls do overestimate Democrats, you know, I... You know, I think that Sherry Beasley has a very good chance at getting a lot of black turnout and winning, but I think that Ted Budd is a very good candidate. You know, he's he's kind of a generic Republican with just, you know, a very crazy voting record. You know, Pat McCroy was definitely, you know, the wrong choice for Republicans. And, you know, I think, you know, they made a good decision with Ted Budd, but they really need, you know, they're going to need to start investing in this race if it, you know, continues to be this close. So right now I'm going to put North Carolina as a tilt state. I think it'll be just under 1% for Ted Budd. You know, I, I think Trey Beasley very well could win. I think it's the most possible that it's ever been. You know, North Carolina has really evolved on my map. I've had it, you know, as, you know, I originally had it as likely, then it was lean, and now it's tilt. I'm just like a little bit away from putting it as a Democratic state. But, you know, in Alaska, you know, that result was due to ranked choice voting. And, you know, it, it is a very good sign for Democrats, but, you know, the question is, will it translate into a state that's a lot less pro-choice than Alaska, but still is bluer? Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Right now, I still am very hesitant about this race, but I'm putting it as tilt Republican for Ted Budd. In Nevada, Cortez Mosto and Sisolak have been struggling in Senate and governor elections. Lack Salt's definitely a good candidate, but his views on abortion are going to hurt him. Uh, you know, we've been got, we've been getting a lot of new polls out of the state. Trafalgar, which predicted Trump will win the state in 2020, uh, you know, has Laxalt up by three. I don't know how much I believe that poll. 
Cortez Mazda ha has been, you know, struggling to get over 50%, but still, Nevada polls do typically underestimate Democrats. It's one of the few states where that does routinely happen. It didn't happen in 2020. And with Nevada's, you know, in the, with the Las Vegas, um, you know, economy, you know, pretty much revived, you know, you know, Biden was still able to win the state by the same amount as Hillary in uh, 2020. You know, it was still possible that Trump would win the state. And, you know, he knew that if he didn't win Nevada, he wouldn't win the election. But still, you know, he, he you know, kept his hopes of winning the presidency alive, but he still needed other states. And so, you know, he campaigned there, but he needed, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And so I think, you know, Nevada is very close. I had it as lean, you know, just a couple of days ago, you know, in between the predictions, because I changed them, you know, in between predictions. But, you know, it's still going to be very close, still a complete toss up. But, Abortion is going to help Cortez Masto. She's very strong with Hispanics, and you know it, it's it's going to be very close. But I think that uh, she has a very narrow advantage right now. And finally, in the state of Wisconsin, this race has gotten so so close, so so fast. Ron Johnson, yes, he is a controversial, but yet you know strong incumbent. I talked about you know I kind of feel bad for doing my video so early, but you know, before a lot of these new polls came out, but Mandela Barnes is doing very well in polling, and I know it's Wisconsin, it's set, you know, the polls there said that Biden was up by 8 on election day, and he won by 0 0.6, you know, I, I, I get it, I get it. it, it, polls in Wisconsin almost always overestimate Democrats, but Trafalgar, if you look at this poll, let's, let, let's go to this poll, the party participation, Republicans have a two-point lead over Democrats. But the man Della Barnes has a two-point lead over over Ron Johnson. Now, I don't think he's going to win by two. I don't think he's even going to win by one. If he wins at all, it's going to be very, very close. But we're getting to the point now where, you know, I, I can't really keep underestimating Democrats. And polls in Wisconsin were very accurate in 2018. You know, I harp about how I think Tony Evers is not that inspiring of a candidate. And, you know, Barnes is overperforming him in the polls, which is not something I expected. But Evers, you know, was expected to win by one in a research co-poll. He won by just that against Scott Walker. In uh, the Senate election, Tammy Baldwin, a uh, research co, said that she would win by 11. She won by that. So polls in Wisconsin, you know, really, you know, Johnson, you know, he did, yes, he did over estimate, you know, or he did over perform the polls by a lot in 2016. But he doesn't have the Trump effect to help him, you know. The, the polls in Wisconsin have, you know, really started to go downhill in 2016 and 2020, and they were pretty accurate in 2018. Yes, Evers should have won by more, and, you know, it was a pretty, you know, but still, they were still spot on in both the governor and Senate races. And, you know, with Democrats, you know, getting, you know, to a point where, you know, they're flipping Pennsylvania, they're doing so much better nationally, they just flipped Alaska, yes, it was because of ranked choice voting, but Mary Pell told us should not have gotten that many second place, uh, second choice votes from uh, all those Nick Begich voters. I am, you know, very, you know, apprehensive about Wisconsin, but I'm giving it to Mandela Barnes. I have underestimated him. He is doing extremely well. Trafalgar was pretty accurate in 2020, you know, when everyone was saying Biden was going to win the state by the high single digits. Trafalgar, you know, had the race as pretty much a dead heat in their last poll. It was like 47 to 47, you know, and uh, Biden ended up winning the state by less than a, percent, than a percentage point. But, you know, even though Ron Johnson's, you know, a good incumbent, he's very unpopular in the state. And with Trump being in the news day after day after day, you know, and Ron Johnson's involvement in you know, trying to overturn the election results in Wisconsin and Michigan. That's not going to help him in Wisconsin. And, you know, I can't keep, uh, you know, I'm getting to the point now, you know, we're, we're getting to the point now where we keep over underestimating Democrats. We keep saying, well, the polls overestimated here, and the polls underestimated them them there. And, you know, it, it's true. You know, Democrats do typically do worse than polling suggests in, you know, the eventual midterms, you know, in the eventual elections, the eventual final results. But Wisconsin is just so close, 538, which, you know, I don't really trust their, um, you know, predictions for uh, the governor race. You know, I, 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 everyone likes to dump on 538. I really like 538, but I don't really trust their results in the governor election. You know, if Tony Evers being favored, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but Barnes is up on average by four points in the polls. He's doing extremely well. You know, I said he was too progressive to really, you know, get a lot of that turnout. But he's going to get a lot of Milwaukee turnout, and, you know, he might win Door County. You know, the Bill Weber that, you know, almost everyone in Wisconsin wins, you know, in a statewide election. 
you know, Ron Johnson is really, really not doing well. And the fact that Barnes is reaching 50% in some of these polls says all you need to know about Wisconsin. It's a very close state. Um, but right now, I think that Mandela Barnes has a very, very narrow advantage if the election was held right now. I think Ron Johnson can still win. He'll probably overperform the polls. I don't think that Barnes is going to win by four points. But, you know, polls are a lot more accurate in Wisconsin when Trump's not on the ballot. And, you know, Ron Johnson was overestimated in 2010, underestimated in 2016. He doesn't have Trump on the ballot to help him. You know, it's not a presidential election year. If this was in 2024, I would say Johnson is favored. You know, I've had Johnson as favored, you know, throughout the entirety of my Senate election prediction history. I've had it as lean Republican in all but one of my, you know, um, predictions. I had it as uh, tilt once. But now I think the Democrats have a very narrow advantage. They're proving to do a very, very good job in a lot of these races and making them closer. They flipped Alaska, and I think they might, you know, they, they have a very narrow advantage in, you know, a lot of these swing states right now in the Senate, including Wisconsin. So yeah, for the first time in my entire 2022 Senate election prediction history, I am characterizing Wisconsin as a blue state. So the final map, I'm sorry that this video was super long, but I don't think it's too long. I think it's like 30 or 35 minutes, so it's a lot better than my previous one. Democrats win 52 seats to Republicans 48. Last time it was 51 to 49. Democrats pick up seats in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, and guess what? Mansion and Cinema's votes do not count. You know, Democrats can now pass a lot more legislation if this prediction ends up holding true, which I think it would if the election was held today, but it might be inaccurate come November. And, you know, I'm probably going to be wrong about some of these states, but, you know, I, I, I really don't know. You know, Democrats are doing really well. They're overperforming expectations. And, uh, yeah, Manchin and Cinema's votes won't matter. Democrats can eliminate the filibuster for, you know, can get rid of the filibuster for a lot of pieces of legislation. Fetterman and Barnes will most likely vote with Democrats if they are elected, you know, uh, to get rid of the filibuster. And, yeah, it's just looking really, really good for Democrats and really, really bad for Republicans in both the Senate and, you know, the House and the governorships. You know, this was one of the easiest year on record for the Republican Party in the entire 21st century. And now they are struggling to even win a single win, uh, flip a single Senate seat from the Democratic Party when it's a 50 50 Senate. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, share the video. Turn on notifications. If you disagree with my prediction, please comment it down below. But be polite. You know, don't make the comments into a war. Uh, the comments section into a war zone. Uh, you know, check out my non-political channel, Interactor One Two Seven, if you want to see some reaction videos and uh, you know some non-political content. And uh, yeah, and check out my uh, comrade Growlings is Six Six Six. You know, check check everyone. You know, check check um you know those channels out. Hope you guys enjoy this video, and I'll see you guys uh, next time when I talk about all things politics. See ya.